Three, two, one. Welcome in, Life on the Red podcast. Sipple's on it today, uh, counting us in with that. It's 11, That's 16 a.m., uh, 318, March 18th, 2022. The NCAA tournament day two is tipped off. Um, you're Damn, what a day. It. What a first day. Woo. It was incredible. Sipple, did you watch a bunch of it? I watched quite a bit of it. I was very interested in Creighton. Yeah, um, I didn't see Iowa go down, but I'm, I'm I'm sort of amazed by that. The Big Ten, well, two and three, two and three, not off to a good start. Two and three, and one of the ones was Michigan, who might have been the worst team that played yesterday. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to talk about start. that. Yeah. yeah, not a good start. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about that here momentarily. I do want to mention the Husker women playing Gonzaga at two thirty this afternoon. We're not going to talk about them a whole lot because by the time you listen to this, that game is probably going to be over. So. Really intriguing matchup there with the Zags for for Nebraska's women. Uh, but let's get into it. NCAA tournament, like you said, Sip, kind of a crazy day. We had multiple double-digit seeds winning. Iowa goes down, uh, maybe the hottest team in the country. Creighton uh, needs a 9-0 run at the end of regulation and a 6-0 run at the end of overtime to get past San Diego State. They lose Ryan Cogbrenner in the process. They're big man, uh, already playing without their point guard, Nimhard. Got it done. Uh, really impressive display of, of grit by Creighton uh, in that game. I think we can all agree on that. But And we'd be remiss we didn't mention Teddy Buckets, Teddy Allen. Oh, yeah. 37 Teddy Buckets. On UConn. Incredible game. Um, hit the go-ahead three. Came up with a big defensive play. Drove down, got a layup, and an and one. Finished off the free throw line. Awesome performance by him. Um, I guess. Oh, but let's stay on Buckets for a second. Let's stay, let's on, stay buckets. on Buckets. Yeah, Buckets, New Mexico State shot 13 free throws. He shot them all, and he made them all, by the 13 way. 13 for 13. Yeah, 13 for 13. He was the WAC player of the year. So Teddy Buckets went to New Mexico State and and really is closing his career strong. It's really – it's a fa- it's fascinating what he did. Yeah, it is. You know? It is. I'm, th- I'm thrilled for him because yeah. um, it, it didn't work at Nebraska, and that, that's fine. Sometimes it doesn't work. Obviously, Teddy's taken a long road to get to where he is. And, and he found a spot where he could kind of, you know, be reborn a little bit. You know, he's, he's playing in a, he's playing for a team and a program that kind of allows him to do what he does. He's, he's going to take a lot of shots and he's going to do some stuff. That's awesome. And he's going to do some stuff where you're going, what the hell is that guy doing? I think he started 0 for six from the field last night. So he made 10 of his last 18 shots after he started 0 for six last night and made every manner of shot you want to make. I saw I think it was Jonathan Gavoni this morning tweeted about Teddy Allen's the the uh, ESPN draft expert. He said Teddy made himself some money last night. So Do you think so? He's interesting, isn't he? Because yeah. Well, first of all, I want I want to say something. I want to ask you a question. The Teddy's not a riser. He's he, he can't. He's not no. a great athlete. You no. know, he doesn't. He can dunk, of course, but he's not a above the rim guy. What was the was the issue at Nebraska that we, it was he just too ball dominant at Nebraska? That that was a big part of it. Yeah, I think a lot of it was he was ball dominant, you know, and it's that's not what what Fred wants in his offense. Now, obviously, they they play with a ball dominant point guard most of the year this year and won ten games, so that maybe that maybe tells you something too. But yeah, I think there I think that was part of it. I think there was probably some personality clash there uh, in the locker room a little bit, especially late in the year um, when things weren't going good. So, yeah, it was a deal where Nebraska brought him in and they took a chance. And if, if he was great, then then it worked out. And it, 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 he was still pretty good. He let him in scoring, but it just didn't, it just didn't work out. Had the 41-point game, of course, uh, for Nebraska. But, yeah, I mean, you're talking about a guy that's been in, what, five different colleges now? West Virginia, Wichita State, Western Nebraska, Nebraska, now New Mexico State to finish off his career. Is he going to go to the NBA? I don't know, uh, but he'll play. He'll make a lot of money wherever he goes, whether it's in here or whether it's over in, in Europe and has such a unique game. Simple, like you said, it's, it's kind of, it's almost herky jerky, but it's kind of smooth at the same time. Uh, he just kind of does some, some unique weird stuff yeah. that you don't see a lot of players do, but he makes really, really hard. He takes really, really hard shots and he makes really, really hard shots. Yeah, he's and sort of an artist. He's sort of an he artist. Is. He is a little, that's a good way of putting it. He's an artist yeah. and you know, it's, it's like any other artist. Some, it, it doesn't appeal to some people and, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, he's got, he's got a, he's got a painting <laughs> in front of him. And, and last night he, he painted a pretty good one. So yeah, it was pretty cool to see Teddy go off 37 last night, and finish that baby off. That, um, he, he scored 37 of their 70. 
So yeah. more than half wow. their points. He took Man. it took 50 shots and he took 24 of them. So virtually half their shots, all of their free throws, like you said, Baz. And then yeah, or yeah. And then the other thing that was crazy is I mean, he sort of got the full Teddy experience in the in to the good. Um, and also sort of walking right up to the line there at the end where he, you know, he hit a big shot and then he, he came up with that steal and had no designs of working the clock. I mean, he went oh, right he to, was the going rack, to the room, got yep. fouled. And then like, they, they talked for a solid, like three or four minutes on the broadcast about how the referees showed great restraint. And then one of the announcers said more restraint than they probably should have showed in not teeing him up for what? gone at the guy who fouled him and go, you know going over and to the crowd and he was he was waving goodbye to the crowd and he was talking to the opposing <laughs> players like what before he went to the line to shoot the end <laughs> uh, he, he yeah. pushes the limit he pushes it right to the line right he yeah, does, he does. And, and then, and then, then he uh, steps up to the free throw line and he makes it <laughs> yeah. yeah and the bench the guys on the bench I mean you could tell you could tell that they you know watching him that they were like they, they were pretty. his teammates enjoyed watching him carry them on to the second round. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that that's it's the kind of attitude that can that can lead you to a 12 five upset over a blue blood. It's the kind of attitude that can have you at five different schools. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> which begs a question. Where does he go for alumni weekend? <laughs> Does he just go to all of them? Just goes to all of them. <laughs> yeah, they coordinate the schedule. Spends half of his year all. doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Five consecutive weeks. Uh, we joke, but hey, I put I put New Mexico State in the Sweet Sixteen. I think Teddy's got another one in him. Nice uh, pick. Hey, that's a good done. pick. So, because so, now now will they play? Will they play the winner of Arkansas Vermont? Right. Yeah, Arkansas won that game. Won a close. Oh, game well, Arkansas won. won. Okay. The yeah, winner of Arkansas game. and Vermont. Which is Arkansas. <laughs> I didn't see anything from Arkansas last night that leads me to believe that's that's not going to be a game. Like, and that's the Public thing with the NCAA tournament. If you've got a guy like Teddy, like if you've got a guy that can get you uh-huh. 30, can get you 40, you got a shot against anybody. I mean, UConn's not very good offensively, but they they grind and they play defense and they could not stop Teddy. And that was the difference. And God, that's amazing. San Diego State moves on. It's just, or excuse me, New Mexico State moves on. San yeah, Diego no, talk, State. Yeah, go ahead. Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. I was going to no, say, go San Diego ahead. State did not move on because Creighton beat them uh, in overtime last night. Um, it's it's so interesting to me because the way Creighton won and the way Creighton has won, it's just such a departure from what they've been. It's it's like it's this gritty, grimy defense first, you know, low scoring. <laughs> And it was going to be a little scoring last night playing San Diego State. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But just the way they, you know, we've seen, we think of Creighton as this high-flying, three-point shooting, kind of finesse team a little bit. And they've, they've really found a different identity this year. They, last night, last night, I, yeah, that's the way I always think of Creighton. I, always, I mean, for a long time, I felt like if Creighton's not making threes, they're really vulnerable. They, made, they only made two threes last night, yeah. two for 14 and won that game. See, you're right. They, they do, it is a little different. Um, a lot of it's Ryan Hawkins, right? Love that. I mean, guy. they got a yeah. guy who won three national titles at the Division II level at Northwest Missouri State. And I heard, I, I was, I, I, for some reason, I wanted to listen to the radio broadcast, John Bishop and Nick Baugh. And then I was listening to the post game. And one of the Creighton players was talking about Hawkins. And this is a championship move. When, when Kalk Brenner went down, um, Ryan Hawkins got the guys together. And they asked him the question. Well, they asked Hawkins this: What was what what was the message? He said, "Well, first of all, I just want I just didn't want the guys to be standing there looking at Ryan. You know, it wasn't productive. And then second of all, now listen, now this is a player. He said, second of all, we had to make some minor defensive adjustments at that point. So I got the guys together and said, look, it's not going to be. We can do this. We just got to do this, this, and this. That's a player on the court. I mean, yeah. How valuable is that? Yeah, he's unbelievable, and that's that's where his value is because he's a winner." And he knows how exactly. to win. And yes, he, he leads them in scoring. He's a good rebounder, but that dude wins. And it, he's, a, he's a fascinating story. Coming out of high school, he had one scholarship offer, and it was to Wayne State uh, in Nebraska. Is that right? Think about that. And, and I, think, I think Northwest offered him late in the process, so he went there. Like you say, I think he redshirted his first year down there, Northwest Missouri, at a Division II school, Northwest Missouri. Now, that's a great program, but 
redshirted his first year, turned himself into a great player. And now look at him, he's in the second round. Yeah, well, he team. has the advantage. He's probably 31 years old. He's 31 <laughs> years old. Yeah, he's, he's got a he's got a mortgage. Three and a kids. Pension, a couple yeah. kids at home. Yeah. He's got a second wife. He's, um, he's been divorced twice. So he's been through it all. He wakes up in the morning and like has to do that old man, like stretch, like, <laughs> ah! <laughs> just moaning and groaning, getting out of bed. Okay, Parker, what about uh, two and three in the Big Ten? How's that shake you? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, part of that is because they had two teams that just barely got in, right? I mean, that's true. You know, you're talking yeah. about the first four, I think, changes that conversation a little, a little bit. I mean, I thought, mm-hmm. like, we were talking simply yesterday about Rutgers in that, in that game. And man, I mean, Rutgers just, it was like a sieve going Notre Dame's just like, I know. Would you like another layup? Here you go. Yeah. Which was so bizarre, like given how how tough, like going to playing against Rutgers usually is like going to the dentist or something, you know? Like yeah. tougher than a long weekend at your in-laws. Am I right, Baz? Yeah. Thanks, um, Rothstein. Yeah. <laughs> but they just they had no, they, they just could not keep Notre Dame. And that's probably a large amount of credit for that goes to you know, Notre Dame and all that, but that surprised me. I wasn't, I wasn't surprised that, uh, that, that Indiana won that game. And then I'm also not surprised that, I mean, it just, that's a pretty tough ask. I mean, I know it's that time of year for everybody, but man, that's a tough ask to win. They were in a brutal spot. Yeah. And they didn't even leave Dayton until four in the morning or something. They landed at Portland at 7 a.m. the morning after the game. Yeah. yeah. Oh God, really? Now, I didn't for, oh, that was a whole deal with their. Yeah. They had to bring in like a different plane or a different pilot or something like that. They some they, they they said they get what um Zach Osterman who does a great job covering them obviously said was that they got to the airport and the plane wasn't big enough for their traveling party. It's like really yeah that well, strikes me as that? something you should have figured out before two o'clock in the morning after the first four. And that's that, on the NCAA. That an they, oh, that's, that's that's an NCAA. The NCAA sets all that up for the teams. Yeah, in handles okay, that, that, first. that would really be upsetting. Yeah. Well, I, somebody else was tweeting that they didn't think their plane was big enough to handle the wind over, yeah, the, over the Rocky Mountains. Like, what are they? Like, think about flying? that. Yeah. Like, Jesus. So, hey, yeah, um, but look, they, were, they weren't winning that game. Like, St. Mary's good, and they played pretty good. I didn't but, think it – I picked St. Mary's. I didn't think it was going to be five. They were up no, I didn't think it would be 35 third, in the yeah. second half or something yeah. like that, but – I mean, I think Iowa obviously is the biggest disappointment, you know, and this is, this is 11 29 on Friday. And right at this very moment, Ohio state's playing a loyal Chicago. And there's obviously, well, there's a bunch more big 10 teams today, right? Michigan state, Illinois, Wisconsin, Purdue, uh, Purdue. So, you know, Purdue the story. Path looks a little easier, but we can, yeah, no that. kidding. Thanks a lot. St. Peter's. Um, yeah. Right. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not a great start, obviously, but I think the – and it could it could certainly go bad for the Big Ten quickly at this point, but um, I think the story is still to be written. But, man, Iowa, wow. I, I've Brutal. never – I've always just waited it out in the winter. You just wait for the McCaffrey, you know, the Fran McCaffrey, like the swoon where they uh-huh. lose five out of six or something. And it just – I finally bought them this year because they were playing so good. They looked – they no. were so good offensively, and they just didn't shoot the ball well. and. There you go. See you later. Yeah. Baz, Baz, I think they won. I think they had won 12 of 14 going into yes. the tournament. Nine and, and won their last 10. Yeah. And they looked, you know, they won the Big Ten. They beat Purdue in a, not a home court for Purdue, but in, you know, Purdue's yeah. area and looked really impressive doing it. So you asked the question is there anybody now you trust in the Big Ten? I mean, do you really trust anybody? No, no. Oh, I, I don't know. trust Michigan uh, State, which is a turnover machine. Yeah, but they are. They're, it sounds weird to say that about an Izzo team, but man, they turn it over. Remember Bass against Nebraska? How much they turned it over? Uh, just an alarming. We were alarmed by the number of turnovers. Yeah, yeah and they never cool. really solved it. You thought, okay, yeah. well that's Izzo team. They're doing that right now. But by the end of the year, they no by March. Yeah, Mar- yeah, in Maryland against Maryland in the Big Ten tournament, they had eleven turnovers in the in down the stretch of that game. It's just brutal. Yeah. Like I kind of trust Purdue because they're going to have the best guy on the court uh, against whoever they play. And, you know, in the tournament, one game scenario, if you've got the best guy, you're going to have a pretty good chance, but still they don't play great defense. They're susceptible to getting beat. You know, Wisconsin is a great team, but they play a lot of close games and all you need is one to go the wrong way. Like they did against Nebraska and you're done. 
So they're also the worst. They're also like the the second worst three point shooting team in the Big Ten. So yeah, they're not hitting. I mean, anybody they could beat anybody, and if if they don't shoot it well, which they don't statistically this year, then anybody can play. You know, if they if they keep advancing, they would probably get Auburn in the Sweet Sixteen, and I don't like that matchup for Wisconsin. Auburn, I believe, guys is too athletic for Wisconsin. They are, and if, if Auburn's guards haven't been playing great, but if they play a little better, they're going to be like I've got them in the Final Four. Like, there's I no front they're... line advantage. There's no front line advantage for Wisconsin that game. No, no, not Auburn's. That game. Auburn's gigantic. Jabari Smith's a freak show. And Walker yeah. Kessler leads the country in yeah. block shots. Good job. Good job, Pat. Yeah, that's it. Walker Kessler's a seven-footer. Yeah. He's got two triple doubles this year with blocks. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> to, to, get, to get to the Sweet 16, though, Wisconsin's <laughs> playing in Milwaukee, and they play Colgate Friday night, and then the winner of Iowa State and an LSU team that has neither its head coach nor its associate head coach. So playing – Where's the associate head coach? Yeah, flyer too. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's a pretty I good knew, draw. I, that's a pretty good draw for Wisconsin. The question is if they're good enough to capitalize on I, it. I knew that the good I knew good get good ass offer got fired, but I didn't know his assistant got fired. Strong, Strong ass, ass offer and, Strong his, ass. and his associate. Yeah. <laughs> Strong ass. Mildly offer. ass offer. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly less strong ass offer. But yeah, Iowa. <laughs> My God, Iowa. Yeah. Jesus. And you could see it. Like, you could see it in the first half. Like, they weren't making Boy. anything. Like, Keegan Murray missed a couple in close. And then he, like, didn't touch – the, didn't get a shot for, like, 20 straight minutes in that game. Ooh. Like, how do you not get Keegan Murray a shot for, like, 20 straight minutes? It's, and, hard, you know, it's hard to play the game with one hand around your – There there was a stretch in the second half. There was a moment where Patrick McCaffrey hit back-to-back threes. Like, they were down six. Patrick McCaffrey, I think it was, hit back-to-back threes from the same spot. They tied the game and I was like, okay, here it comes, you know, like, cause they've been able to do, they were, that's one of the things like they were able to do that over the second half of the season where at some point they just punched the accelerator for five minutes. I mean, Nebraska saw it. They put a game away against Nebraska in like four minutes, you know? Um, and I thought, I thought, okay, here it is better late than never Iowa. And then they just couldn't, yeah, they just, they just couldn't really keep it together. Down the yeah, I think it was a, I think it was a 10 0 run and like, 91 seconds or something like that. They scored that 10 right? points about 90 seconds. And then that Richmond was it. did? No, Iowa did. To get oh, back to, to get, yeah, and then, to get I, back and, in. And Richmond just stayed with what they were doing, and Iowa went back to missing shots, and that was it. I mean, to be was, fair, Chris was, Murray definitely got fouled. I mean, he did. He <laughs> did. Terrible call. But you know what? But they played, they just, I mean, they played bad luck to me. Yeah. Iowa put themselves in position to be victimized by a bad call. So 100%. that's what it was. Now, uh, I got one question. I got one question before we go on. Yeah. Now, this is a hard one, so get ready. I'm ready. Um, and I, I don't know where to go with this. You watch these teams, though, and what you see is a lot of – like you're. it's sort of surprising to me how much talent there is out there, and it's spread around so much, right? Like yes. you'll check out a team – I don't know. I'm going to look at my bracket. And a team I've watched – well, like Notre Dame. I was kind of surprised how good Notre Dame was in the way, at least in the way Bray recruited that team, they, he recruited a bunch of good shooters. Yeah. So the talent spread around, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pretty good teams out there. Does that, is that a damning statement about Nebraska in general? And the fact it's never won an NCAA tournament game, or does that illustrate why it's so tough? I, I, I don't know which one it is. I think it could be both. Couldn't it? Kind like, of. you know, you look at like, look at Nebraska, the last month of the season, right? Like they were at the beginning, you know, over that, the first two weeks, they were completely lost. And two weeks later, they were beating Ohio state and Wisconsin on the road. You know, I mean, you saw both ends of, and look at the end of the day, Nebraska won 10 games and, and struggled mightily most of the year. So that tells you that the talent at Nebraska wasn't probably on par with where it needed to be in the big 10. I mean, that's just what it is. So, but then at the end, you, you see how they play. And we all watch it, and they they looked like they belonged against Wisconsin. I know they, they did. Like they belonged against Ohio State, you know. And they're mm-hmm. up 15 on Northwestern at the Big Ten tournament with 15 minutes left. I'm going. They might win three games, up here. you know. It, it's and then they blow it. it. It's just. I think it just. I think it, more than anything, it, it probably illustrates how fine the line is. You know how yeah. hard it is to to be really good, um, mm-hmm. to be a tournament team. Um, 
And it's why it's why you see these coaches get paid a lot of money, especially at the power five level, because, you know, look at look at Texas A&M, who won 23 games, made the finals of the SEC tournament. And they're in the NIT, you know, because they they start, I think they went 15 and one and they lost eight in a row. And then they went like seven and two in the season or something like that. You know, you know what it is? is, What's that? Some of it. I mean, it's not an easy answer, but some of it. Okay, let's go to crate. Some of it is culture and system and coach. Absolutely. It it is because Creighton makes it pretty much every year. Well, and look at Creighton, like they they don't dominate with talent. Yeah. No, you know. no, they didn't this year. They lost all five starters from last year. And yeah, yet, and, and Kaluma's a freshman. Ahead, Al, Kaluma's a freshman. Alexander Trey Alexander, who I mean, Alexander was the dude down the stretch yeah. uh, for them. Made it just play after play. Freshman. We were talking about Hawkins already. I mean, Division two guy. You know, I just and then every time you look around, like I thought I, I was watching Acker, and I was like, man, Akron doesn't look scared of UCLA at all, and their point guard could really play. And like every yeah. team you turn on, it's like you look pretty good, have, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's and it's part of its self selection, right? Like if you make the tournament, like you need good guard play to make the tournament and, and be good in college basketball at some point. But gosh, every game you turn on, there's a lead guard, and some of them are five nine, and some of them are six six. But everybody has these guys that are offense igniters, and yeah. that's just really been a struggle under Hoiberg so far for for Nebraska. Birch started playing better. Nebraska yeah, started playing a lot better. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's, it might just be as simple as that, you know, and that's, that's the thing. You've got to have a guy who's, when he's going to have the ball in his hands, you've got to have a guy in that position. You've got to have a dude and you've got to have a dude that, that plays, plays with a level of confidence and swagger, but also does it within the confines of what you're trying to do as a program and as a team. And that's, that's the balance Nebraska hasn't found in three years yet. Basically, yeah, I, and, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Sip, go I ahead. don't believe it's simple. I don't. I, I just, I think it takes a lot to to become a team that consistently makes the NCAA tournament. I don't. The only thing I can think of simple is you could drop Rick Pitino in an Alaska Anchorage and he'd be in the Sweet Sixteen. That's the only thing I can think of that's simple. But it, yeah. otherwise, I think it's really. I think it's a pretty complex equation. In most cases, I must have missed who Iona's playing in the tournament. <laughs> did they not make it? No, they didn't. They lost their conference championship. Yeah. How the hell did that happen? Well, got out coached, probably. Pro- <laughs> no, they did not. Get out <laughs> I don't even know who they lost to. Was it St. Peter's? It was probably St. Peter's. They have to forfeit for COVID or something. They were 17 and three in their league, and then they lost in their first game of the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference tournament to Ryder. Noted Ryder. Ryder. Mac Power Ryder. That's but that's St. Peter's Conference, right? St. Peter's won the won the Mac, so. the MAAC. Oh, is that St. Pete? Is that St. Peter's Conference? I'm thinking, yeah. I think that's their conference. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So all right, but all right. Again, I, look at we're, look at what we're talking about. John Calipari couldn't. Coach Kentucky right. past freaking St. Peter's, like it happens, you know. I and know. I know it's just a St. Yeah, the St. Peter's coach had a great quote. He said, "You know what? You don't in this tournament. I told our guys, you don't have to be better than the team you're playing. You just have to be better that day. Yep. So let's yep. just be better today. It's not a four of seven NBA yep. series. Just be. You just have to be better on that day." Shaheen Holloway, Seton Hall legend, Shaheen Holloway, coach really? Sock Yep. What, yeah. what do you mean? Is what, why was he a legend there? That's where he played in college. He was he was like good? a legendary high school player um, back. He's like you know in the mid nineties, um, just one of those like you know came from I forget where he's from, but oh he's from New York City. He's like a New York City legend. You know, great wow. high school player. Went to Seton Hall, had a pretty solid career there, and now now here he is. Leading now he's Peace. a legend for another reason. Now yeah. Now he's leading St. Peter's into a 15-7 matchup in the second round to go to the Sweet 16. Yeah, Murray State. I mean, they got Murray State. The Racers. Love me. So- did you watch that game last night, Sip? That was a late I did not watch Murray State. That was a good they late. had a stretch. That game went to overtime, and they had a stretch where the teams combined to make nine straight shots in overtime. Whoa. It was amazing. I was, like, off my couch walking around. It's like, 1030. 
Yeah, I was whipping my shirt around over my head. Like, let's go. What game? There was a game yesterday. Uh, there's, I can't remember. I don't even remember which one it was now. There was a game yesterday that started with more than eight minutes straight of uninterrupted play. It was awesome. It was uh, South Dakota State. Yeah, that's right. Oh, South Dakota was, State. Yeah. yeah. I turned it on. They went on their little mini run. I saw, um, I saw Shireman throw a behind the back pass for a layup. And then, uh, and yeah, they played like beyond the under 12 line before the first whistle blew the entire game. It was sweet. Ba- Baylor Shireman with the most unnecessary behind the back pass in the history of NCAA yeah. college basketball. Like that's, you can tell he's from Nebraska because that's like every Nebraska town team basketball player ever throwing that. <laughs> All right, let's switch gears. That was good though. That was, God, you that was know your, yeah, it's, uh, amazing we'll knowledge. It basketball. Like um, let's talk about what happened at 11.02 a.m yesterday uh, right as the tournament was getting ready to tip off the email went out Matt Abdel Massey and Nebraska uh, mutually parting ways I don't think it was a huge shock to most of us I think the only the only real suspense with it was the relationship that Matt Abdel Massey and Fred Hoiberg have they're very close friends they've worked together since 2008 at Timberwolves Fred's never coached a day in college with that out Matt on his bench so that was maybe the one thing where you went that maybe gave you a little pause that, that he might stay, but it ends up being the first move. Um, the first of what we expect to be several moves this off season. And it's a big one. As I wrote yesterday, you know, it, it's going to fundamentally change the way Nebraska basketball recruits. It's no longer going to be Matt going out and getting guys and bringing them to Fred and filling out the roster. It's going to be more of a staff wide approach. We've already seen, um, excuse me. We've already seen Nate Linzer out and about, uh, at Nebraska high schools. You know, it sounds like Fred Hoiberg is the one that reached out to Sam Greasel, the North Dakota State transfers who went to Lincoln East and, and made contact, has met with him. So it's it's no longer going to be just Matt Abdel Massey collecting talent. And look, he collected talent. Uh, he had a top 20 class this year. He's got a top 35 class for next year. And but look, the results are the results. It didn't work. It, the pieces didn't fit. Um, and so Nebraska moves on from, from Matt Abdel Massey. Yeah, that was, I read that in your story the other day, and it really, I didn't fast, I didn't know that, that Abdel Massey, that Fred's never coached a college game with, without Abdel Massey. Yeah. And I didn't, and I guess I had forgotten that Fred hired him at minutes when he was with the T Wolves, too. Yeah, it is. That could, that had to be, I would, no, I don't know. Maybe it's not difficult in that business to make that kind of move. I would think it is. Um, I don't know what to say about what you're saying about he obviously recruited talent. So now what, so what are we suggesting? And, and I've heard this suggested today that Abdul Masi did his job recruiting talent. They didn't use it correctly. Now, I don't well, know. Okay. If I don't know if it's I that should, simple. Yeah. I should say that like he recruited talent in the sense that they had highly, highly ranked classes. Let me put it that way. Okay. Um, now that doesn't necessarily mean they had the talent they needed to compete, you know, in the big 10 or whatever. Or maybe it didn't fit. It didn't. Or maybe it didn't fit. fit. The pieces didn't yeah. fit. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's probably a little bit of a little bit of both involved with that. But look, I mean, like, right, a five star recruit is probably going to be a first round NBA draft pick. Like, he could get like. Yeah. You know. Think about what we're talking about right here. Just think about what we're talking about today. Teddy Allen. I mean, he was in the program. Delano yeah. Benton's playing minutes in the NBA. And yeah. Bryce didn't, is, didn't recruit him, right? What's that? Delano. You, you, yeah. No, they did. Oh, they did. Yeah. That's right. That's right. He was in Western Kentucky. That's right. Yeah, yeah he was my bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fine. They recruited Delano Banton, and now, you know, Bryce is almost surefire. I, I, I don't know, Baz. What are you hearing? I, I, I hear, like I was hearing first round, and then a guy told me today, no, it'll probably be second. It's, it, I, it's fascinating because every, you know, you look at the like the projections, and it's a, I see a lot of like late first round. Um, which could mean, you know, late first, early second, as it generally does. But he's going to be a guy, I think, that goes to like the, 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 the draft combine. I, I think he does. I think he's a guy that like really shows well there. Like why? Pick it, because he has the measurables. He's got the wingspan. Um, he's got the athleticism. You know, it, it, if he goes there and shoots it well, like if, he sh- if he's shooting well, he's going to do the same thing Delano Banton did. He's going he's gonna to rock it up, I think. You know, that's how Delano Banton made it. His money. He went to those things and he That's shot right. the crap out of them. You know? That's right. Because he, he, he had everything else. He had the measurables and he, he could do everything else. Do you remember oh, no. that? 
Do you remember Banton hit like, like an incredible number of his three pointers in a Yeah, way. it was like he hit like like 65 out of 100 in a shooting drill or something like that. Yeah. I forget what the number was. It was a great what? I think he sounded really good like when they were just scrimmaging too. Right. So but so if he does that, like if he makes jump shots, then yeah, he's he's a first round pick because he's got everything else. And look, he averaged 70 points a game in the Big Ten as a freshman. Like dude can play. You know what, too? He won't go there and he'll go there and be very impressive as a human. I mean, he's, yeah, he's yeah. a good kid, good, clean kid, stable. Um, yeah. They'll like that part of him too. You know? Yeah. The so. character, there's no character issues. Um, you've got all the measurables. You've got everything you did on film this year as the year went on. And now you've just got to go be yourself, make a few shots. And you're going to make your money. So I'm, again, we're getting off track here, but yes, the, the point is he was brought here by Matt Abdel Mass. And as were some other guys that we talked about. So I, I'm, I'm really curious as I think we all are just to see how different it looks going forward. Like what type of player does Nebraska recruit, you know, where do they recruit players from, you know, that, that sort of thing. And it's probably all yet to be seen. We need to see what the staff's going to look like here in the next few weeks. Uh, we need to see what kind of players they're targeting. Obviously Sam Greasel is a guy they're going to go after pretty hard and probably have a pretty good chance of getting uh, at the end of the day. Tell us about but, Sam. I'll tell you about Sam, Lincoln East grad, um, one of the best guys in the Summit League this year. Average about 15 points a game, six foot six, and had mostly played kind of on the wing or off the ball and took over their point guard position this year and got him within a couple of possessions of the NCAA tournament. You know, um, high level shooter, shot about 48, 49% from the field overall. Big, strong, can rebound in his game. When they played Nebraska down here a couple of years ago, he had, I think, like seven points and 10 rebounds, seven points and nine rebounds, you know, and did that against high major competition. So he's not going to come here and be a guy that scores, you know, if, if he comes here, I should say. He's not going to be a guy that comes here and scores, you know, 15 points a game. But he can get you 10 and he can get you six, seven rebounds. And he's a, you know, he's a leader. He's been in, he's been in the NCAA tournament. He's played in big games. He can clearly play the point guard position. And, and what does Nebraska need? They need a point guard next year. And it's it's kind of we were laughing at this before we started, but how it's kind of entertaining that you know Nebraska gets parts way with this assistant coach. Now it looks like they'll probably bring in a kid from Lincoln East who can play point guard. Like it's just like the most perfect PR move ever for Nebraska basketball. So we'll see if it actually happens. I'm not saying it is. It seems like it's going to. Um, Sam has made no secret about the fact that he's he grew up watching Nebraska, obviously living in Lincoln. So I think it's a good fit there. There's a need. So we'll see what it looks like. But, yeah, that could be kind of one of the first pieces you see Nebraska add is a, is a point guard, and Sam Grizzly is probably the lead candidate. That's, that's sort of one of the things I'm most interested in with all, all of this change is that, that that position, it's obviously so important. And, and they just – the last two years with Banton – and I, I know, like, Banton went to the end of the draft really late in the process, but it, they were going to teach Banton to play point guard, basically. And he had his ups and downs – two years ago and then started to play a little bit better late in the year, but not like what you would consider a, a true point, at least at that stage in his career. And, and, and Trey McGowan's wasn't exactly either. And Alonzo Verge isn't exactly either. McGowan still wasn't. And so like, I'm just, one of the things I'm really curious about is I'm curious how much Fred thinks of that, that is part of the issue. Is it just one piece of the puzzle or is it like trying to play without a quarterback, you know, where you can have all the talent you want around, but if you don't have, uh, you know, the guy that pulls the trigger, then you're going to struggle. And so I don't, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know the answer to that question, whether it's sort of fits in a myriad of other issues or if it's sort of the, the biggest uh, piece, but how Fred, builds his staff and, and recruits this off season probably is going to tell us quite a bit about what he thinks can answer to that question. Baz can answer this. Okay. And I can't, but I'm, I can almost, I can almost answer that Parker, but I think Baz can at Iowa state, he won without conventional point guards, at least two of those years. I think it was one of year he had Royce white hand, Royce had right had the the ball. Yeah. forward. Yeah. Point forward. Yeah. Point forward. Um, correct. Now, I'm going to counter that by saying he also had a guy named Monty Morris. Who, but did they play together? 
Did they did they play together? No, Monte Monte was there for Fred's last four years. Um, okay. And Monte Morris left Iowa State as the NCAA's all-time leader in assists. Okay. So he had a guard, Monte Morris, now with the Nuggets, of course. And so Fred knows, look, you've got to have somebody that can run the offense, whether it's Royce White, whether it's, you know, a true point guard, whatever it is. They haven't had a great initiator. Yeah, they had their best one was probably Cam Mack. <laughs> and he probably had the least talent out, you know. And so you can't, you can't and, and, and there was off the off. Yeah, like, like, yes, like what? Yes. Yeah, that's goes without saying, but. That, I mean, that's what it's <laughs> it probably does. <laughs> that, I mean, that's what it is for Nebraska. Said. Like the, their best initiator was Cam Mack. Like that's that's yeah. been their best guy at that position. Well, okay, okay, but I would counter with this, Bats. Verge at the end was, I think, their it for the last 10 games, I think he was their best. That's initiator. great. How was he for the first 22? Right, exactly. Now it's perplexing. Here's what Fred told me, which is really odd to me. Fred thought they had something in that exhibition against Colorado. Yeah. Okay. And then even in the set, who was a second exhibition? He even talked about Bruce that. State. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce State. I don't know why he counts that, but the no, no disrespect to Bruce State, but they, so they thought they had it. Now, I don't know what happened, Baz. Like what, what happened between the exhibition and the games leading to the last 10? I have no idea. I, I will maintain, and I would love to sit down and talk to Fred about this, but I will maintain that that loss to Western Illinois in the first game just totally shook them up. I think it screwed up their whole season. And you hate uh-huh. to say that about one game because it's the first, especially the first game of the year. But I will never forget Fred Hoiberg in that post game press conference. Like he looked like a guy that was shook. shook. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't think they had seen that in workouts. I don't think they had expected that. And they came out, and it was what we saw for the first twenty plus games of the year. They just they it just kind of came out of nowhere. And I think it shook them up so badly, coaches and players, that it just took them. I think it took them most of the season to recover from. I really oh, that's do. Possible. And, that's very and, possible. And I don't. I I hate to put words in Fred's mouth. That's why I want to say I'd love to sit down and ask him about that and and see what he would say. But I think, like you said, we we all saw the color. They were beating Colorado by thirty. Uh, in the exhibition game, and Colorado finished in the top half of the Pac-12. Like they weren't terrible. No, they and didn't. They, they didn't make the tournament though, huh? They just barely no, they made didn't, it. They didn't. They lost a lot from last year too. They did, but well, they were still, good. I they mean, were good. They beat Arizona. I thought they were going to make yeah. the turn. Yeah, but yeah, I that's I I just think that that first game against Western Illinois it just was so, so completely different than what they had seen through the summer, through preseason workouts. And I think it just, it really shook them up and it just took them a long time to recover. Now, again, that's just my theory. I don't know. That's a good theory. That's a good theory. Now, just, I mean, I guess this is sort of a statement question or question statement, but Fred's got to have a plan for, to to replace Abdel Masi that has to be strong, right? I mean, I don't think you make that move unless you've got a pretty good idea what you're doing. Um, so that and, could come fairly quickly, I would think. I would think so. And you need it. You need it to because you've got the spring signing period. that's going to open up here in a few weeks. You know, you've got who knows what your roster is going to look like with attrition and transfer portal and things like that. You know, there's going to be there's certainly going to be open spots. There. There's probably going to be a couple open up because Matt Abdel Massey left. And so we'll see what that looks like. But you can't you can't mess around with it. You can't be waiting around till the final four to get a guy hired, um, especially a guy that's going to help you do do a lot of recruiting so yeah it's I'm, I'm interested to see what direction they go you know Fred's obviously got a lot of NBA connections he can tap into he's got some different guys that you know were under consideration when he was hired here uh, to be assistants that he can maybe he can maybe gauge interest in uh, that could fill that role and do more on the court coaching than, than Matt did so yeah I think there's a lot of different directions Fred could go or maybe he just goes completely off off the map and find somebody we're not even expecting so there's, there's, there's a lot to sort through if you're Fred Hoiberg, no doubt, but it's it just, it's a decision. I think you have to make pretty quickly and get somebody in place. Yeah. It's just Fred. I mean, you just wonder, does Fred have this under control? Yeah, you do. And who know they might not be done making changes over there yet. You know, Matt Abdel Massey was the big one, of course, but you know, does Armand Gates stay, you know, what happens with doc where I think we're pretty confident Nate Linzer is going to be back next year. And, and he's obviously been out recruiting, but, 
there's going to be open spots on his staff that need to be filled. And there's going to be a roster that needs to be filled and a team that needs to be built. So yeah, you do wonder, does Fred have a really good grasp on this? And, you know, in talking to Trev Alberts, he, he said it, he said he liked the plan that Fred gave him. He thought it would, it was solid. And now it's up to Fred to execute that. And maybe Fred has this all completely under control and there's nothing to worry about. And they will have a couple new assistant coaches here in the next few weeks and you move on. So it's, it's one of those things where, where time will tell if Fred's got his hands around this completely. Okay. Um, the other, what was my other question about that? Uh, we can, I think we can move on. Um, man, he's in a tough spot. I mean, he, he's going into year four and I don't know. I just don't think this is a situation where you can say, okay, this is Fred can go to the fan base or go to his bosses and say, Hey, I need some time now. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? Be a little more <laughs> runaway, please. Sort of, like, <laughs> sort of like Scott, right? I mean, you, yeah, you're making the big change at a point in the trajectory where it's basically, it's got to work right away. You know, the difference Parker though, is nobody's really saying to Scott, you got runway. You know, no, no, right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, are there people? I mean, I guess I don't know the answer. Are there people that are saying that Fred has a lot of you know, it seemed, seemed like the conversation was pretty substantial about whether he was going to be back or not? Which, yeah, um, I think there's a lot of media that I mean, I think there's some people that would suggest that you know, let's see what the reset looks like. I don't know. I mean, God, it, it's I, you obviously, you guys know me, uh, it's it's somewhat irritating to me like I feel these coaches come here and they get real rich and do nothing I mean like they don't sniff the tournament or if they get in the tournament they don't they they don't they don't come close to winning I mean yeah and I'm not saying he's got to make the sweet 16 or anything but I just think like how about win a game in the tournament let's 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 start with this Fred's 24 and 67 and he's 10 and 61 against high major programs like let's you want to know why the runway is short that's why. Yeah. yeah. They, they're not yeah. competitive against their peers. Let's start with being competitive. <laughs> I mean, they're not. Pretty, yeah. they're not. No, they're not. I know. I mean, right. I'm not trying to be a, a dickhead about it or anything. No, like you don't that. have, you're not. I, they're yeah. just, that's what it is. I mean, they're nine and 50 in the Big Ten in Fred's three years. You know, I can, won, they won four of those games this year, three of them, at the, three of them in a row at the end of the year. I can so. buy the argument that even on his, the way that his contract was restructured, like his buyout next year is still big. Like $11 million, $11 million is still a lot of money for yeah. to buy out a basketball coach. So I can, I could buy the argument that if you get to, you know, toward 500 in the league or whatever, or if you make a major jump, like there's going to be, it's going to make some fi- financial sense to see if you can carry that beyond just next year. But I yeah. don't think like they've gone from, I mean, they've made, a one win jump each year, right? Two wins in the big 10 to three to now four this year. I, I yep. don't think five is going to be a real comfortable number next year. Yeah. If they're going five and 15 in the big 10 next year, we will be doing a coaching search. Uh, yeah. This I, yeah. But what's a big jump? See the proxies. Why, why do, why does the old man get irritated? Because a big jump is eight and 12. I mean, okay, great. I mean, so that gets you in the NIT that nobody talks about anymore, by the way. Yeah, Why does nobody I, talk about the NIT? Yeah. Um, I, I, I uh, but I, you see what I'm saying? The bar. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Fred has done a very good job of lowering the bar to unprecedented levels. I'll give him that. I mean, it's <laughs> the, the bar is incredibly low right now, whereas well, 8 and 12 will be celebrated in Nebraska. Celebrated. I won't be celebrated by anybody on this podcast, I don't think. But yes, no. I get what you're saying. Um, yeah. And look, this is why these 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 agreed upon metrics are kept secret, right? Like, yeah, because if they yeah. weren't, what is every single person who watches Nebraska basketball doing in every single game? Count, oh, count. Oh, lost that one. Now I got to win another one down the road. Oh, oh you can't one. do it. Thanks can't for saying it. that. You cannot release metrics. Yeah, you can't do it. You can't yeah. do it. It's already hard. It's already going to be plenty hard for Fred. There's no doubt about that. Now you're going to put that on top of his head too, uh, when he's trying to turn this thing and put it on top of those players' heads. I, I would say this. I, I think they should. About that. I think they should put him out. But that's, I know you should, Parker. Now here's, this, here's the deal, though. Now, now, Parker, you can counter this. Uh, I'd be surprised if you can, but you might be able to. You're very intelligent. Do you ever see a coach operating under public metrics? 
Yes. Wait, yeah. where? Every, I, I mean, all the time. Uh, every year as we go through a season, it's mostly, it's usually not punitive. I mean, but every year, I mean, Steve Berkowitz, who works for USA Today, tweets out on a weekly basis, uh, Kirk Ferentz just won his eighth game. There's a $400,000 bonus, you know, or whatever, okay, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, is th- that the same are... thing as you have to win this amount of games to retain your job? I don't think, but that's not, but that's not what the, at least I don't know the language of Fred's contract, but that is not, that's a misrepresentation of what's in Scott's deal. The metrics determine whether he gets an extension and a raise, not whether he keeps his job. So, well, but, least, but in, at least in the essence, football isn't that what we're talking about? Isn't that the essence of the discussion? I, not necessarily. I mean, so what happens with, what happens with Scott if they go six and six and win a bowl game, seven and six, like, Probably. Okay. So it's a little bit nuanced, right? Probably Mm -hmm. if he hits the metrics, he's going to keep his job, but failing to hit the metrics is not the cause for fire. Okay. I mean, technically he could not satisfy the metrics and Trev could say, I'm keeping you, but you don't get the extra year and your salary is staying at 4 million. Is that likely? Probably not, but it's not like there's a mechanism in the contract where if you don't hit the metrics, you are fired. That's not the way it works. And so all it is, is it's like in, in Scott's, in Scott's contract, it's an extra year and it's $9 million in salary written into the deal. It doesn't change his buyout, which is arguably the most important facet, but it's not. So it's not like, Oh, he didn't hit the metrics. He's getting fired. It's does he get a contract extension and an extra million in salary for a public official. And I think that should be, I think that should be outlined publicly. I just, yeah. that's just how I feel about it. It's nuanced. Um, it, it, cause I, cause what, what me and Baz were talking about is winning a certain amount to retain your job. And what is that? Totally. You that's know? not, that's not what's in Scott's contract, but right. that's, I don't, but I don't, I don't know about Fred. So that's, and you seldom see that or, or we follow it close more closely. If Boy, coach, yeah. 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 If the coach at Texas Tech this year, we knew he had to win 19, it'd be really interesting, right? Certainly, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You'd also, um, you, that would not be a good way to get a compelling non conference schedule for basketball. So <laughs> I'd have to win 19 games to keep the Oh, job. God, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Why well, playing, what else? Why are they playing uh, Don't again? <laughs> They're playing Don't twice. <laughs> um, guys, we have some breaking news for the podcast. Ooh, let's go. Nebraska head coach Fred Hoiberg announced on Friday that as part of the restructuring of his men's basketball staff, the position of special assistant to the head coach has been eliminated and Doc Sadler will depart the Nebraska program. Oh, oh boy. Um, well, there you go. Quote, Doc has given his heart and soul to the Nebraska basketball program twice in his coaching career, and we appreciate all his contributions to the success of Husker basketball, Hoiberg said. Doc has a great basketball mind and it's been a valuable resource on our coaching staff, both here and at Iowa State. I wish him nothing but the best in the future. Yeah, Doc is at uh, Dylan Talley's funeral this weekend. Um, so I don't know. Now that might be, that might be, I wonder if that's Doc retires now is what I wonder about. Yeah, maybe. Okay, guys, we got to get going. No, we can. Uh, we're, we're good. We can keep going here. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. This is awesome. Like, do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. Me and Parker. Yeah, you guys keep going. Football. Yeah. Should we say, hey, Parker, should we hard yeah. shift to football? Let's hard shift. Okay. So there, the guys are on break, obviously, spring break, and they return Tuesday. Um, which now the question, the question is, how will they, how well will they return? Will it take them yeah. a week to get back, you know, reoriented, reestablished? Do you think that there's a college football coach that has ever been fully satisfied with the way his team came back from spring break? No, no. Which is another thing. Someone asked me the other day, Parker, I don't think a lot of teams have spring break in the middle of their, you know, Nebraska just started doing that. I, I believe Parker was in the Pelini years. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they went a long time. I know covering from the Osborne to Solich, um, through Callahan, there's no, they never, they, there was never a break in the schedule. Right. Um, so it's kind of, it's been, I found, I always find it. If I were a head coach, I just wouldn't allow it. I just, yeah. I, not so a- the problem now a days is the way the spring evaluation period works for recruiting. So okay. 
if they would have waited until after, I mean, it's twofold and we're seeing, or we think we're seeing some of the impact of this, um, like on the injury front, right? Part of it is if you push spring ball back a month and a guy gets hurt in spring ball, he's likely to miss more of the season, depending on what the injury is. You're more at risk being six months out rather than seven. And then the other part of it is the coaches can begin going out on the road and evaluating prospects on April 15th, which is like thir- Wednesday or Thursday after the spring game. And so they wanted to be done by that April 9th okay. date yeah. so that they could use the entire six weeks from yeah. uh, mid-April through the end of May to be out on the road. Recruiting. Yeah, so you can't really push it past April 15th. And they're already starting February 28th. I mean, that's as early as they've started since I've been on the beat. It's the and earliest I've ever seen. They cut their winter conditioning short by a week, I think, to do that so that they weren't just going one week, spring break, four weeks, you know. Mm-hmm. So calendar, I think, dictates a lot of that. And last year it wasn't a problem because uh, there was no spring break, I don't think, because of COVID. That I think that was the way you unelled it. So anyways, yeah, it's, it's not ideal, um, but they're practicing this, this coming week. They're practicing Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, in part because I think Monday, they'll probably, a lot of times the captains or, or leaders will get guys together on Sunday when everyone's back. But I think Monday, probably a substantial amount of running in the cards for the uh, boys on the, on the Nebraska Cornhuskers football team on Monday there. Saturday's coaches clinic, would, would that be, would they, have you heard any updates? Will they open that up to the media? Not that I've heard of, um, you know, that would probably, like, I think for my money, that's, that's probably our, our, our best hope at this point. Um, but I've not heard anything about that being open or a portion of that being open. I want to take a second to address that. Um, I mean, we referred, to, we referred to it in passing that we don't see the practices and I don't know, have we, I don't know if we've pointed out on this podcast that one big reason we don't is because if they would open practice to the media, I don't know that people understand that there would be probably close to 80 media at this practice. And, it, and if it's an indoor practice, that's a logistical issue. Um, there's not a lot, there's not a lot, of, uh, there might not be enough room, you know. I don't think that's the primary reason Scott doesn't invite us over there on a regular basis, but it's definitely part of it. Um, I, I definitely it, now it's it's it plays okay it's plays not just logistic though it is a bit it's a pretty big reason because some of it is a trust issue yeah. and he doesn't literally know it was easier for coaches to let us in back let's say back in the day because there wasn't nearly as many media members 100%. yeah and they and if someone got wayward you would know who their boss is you know where they're from you'd know what entity they work for, but man, now that people, I don't know, I don't know half of them. I mean, I don't know where they come from. I was really, um, this is, yeah, I was real. I was, uh, I was, we were talking about Nebraska being shook against Western Illinois. I was a little shook on the first day of spring ball when we were over there. I was looking around that room and going, Holy crap. There are a lot of people here. It, and that's it was I mean, like a Super Bowl media day. Yeah, it was. And I don't want, I mean, like, you're not going to catch me, like, does it make it hard to get one-on-one interviews? Yes. Is it an ideal setup? No, obviously not. But uh, you're not going to catch me complaining about a lot of people being able to make a living or, you know, part of their living or whatever. No, I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying that's what keeps us it is. It is. Yeah, it's a logistics yeah. issue for sure. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know, Simple, we can take this whatever direction you want, or we can just, I mean, we got, there's three more weeks of spring ball. Like, what? If you were Scott, and we don't know everything, obviously, that's happened the first two weeks. Um, We don't know exactly where a couple of players, including Thomas Fedoni, are health-wise. But if you were Scott and you were going into the last three three weeks here before spring game, like, what do you want to learn? If you had to, you know, pick one thing or two things, like, what would would you like to uncover? Well, I'd keep my focus in the trenches for sure. And specifically, I'd want to – make sure that our run defense is sound um the the run defense is sound and um i'd run it at him <laughs> i would run I'd, I'd, i would and i think by doing that you're also obviously help working on your run game you have some big backs to do it we've heard now that those those 
the, you know, Anthony Grant and Jacques Yant have been guys to kind of keep an eye on. And one, Anthony Grant's five, five, I think Parker, five, 10, five, 11, two, 10. Yes. And I don't know what Yant's going at, but he's in that like six foot two thirty range. He's listed um, at six, two, two forty five. Yeah, he's he, okay. Well, there you go. So that's that can give your defense a pretty good look. And you know, you've heard what I've heard. Well, Frost said it publicly that the offensive line has made obvious strides, and a lot of that is coming off the ball in the run game. Yeah. So I'd want to make sure my defense is fortified up front because, it, and you know why. I mean, think about your own division. Yeah. Think, well, just think what Braylon Allen did against you in November. Um, think about what I was capable of doing. Think about what Minnesota tries to do every game. Um, they, they just barrel it at you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd make damn sure that we don't go into the Wisconsin game just thinking, well, he's going to get 200. We're going to have to figure out a way to win otherwise. You know, it's there's a we've said this a bunch and we're going to probably keep saying it, but the, the defensive line for Nebraska is an area to that needs attending to in some way. And it might just be, it might just be development, right? I mean, maybe, but they lost four guys simple off of that unit that played last year um, in, in Stilly and Deontre Thomas and Damian Daniels uh, and Jordan Riley, Jordan Riley. Right. And, and they don't have, uh, they've added nobody to the program. I mean, they added Brody Tagaloa, but you're not, going to add a high school tight end who, I mean, he, he could end up being a really good player in his career. I, I actually, you know, think he's, he's got some juice and some potential, but you're not going to add a kid who played high school, uh, t- mostly tight end in high school over the summer and think he's going to make a difference on a defensive line in big 10, it's not how it works. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I also, I mean, it's a little iffy that you're just going to waltz into the transfer portal and pull a couple of difference making interior defensive linemen out of there in right. May and June and July. So like they, somebody in there needs to step up in a big way, whether it's Huttmacher or, or Marquise Black or, or uh, Masai Newsom or Raquan Buckley or whoever it is. I mean, they need two probably because, or, you know, Colton Feist is in that conversation too. Yeah. yeah. Um, because they can't just play Casey Rogers and Ty Robinson 70 snaps a game. Um no. And not only that, but there's going to be periods of time where you probably like Garrett Nelson's become a pretty good player uh, in the run game. um, And you look for him to take another step in that, but I don't think it's a guarantee that you can necessarily line up Caleb Tanner or blaze Gunnarsson or Jamari Butler as a four, three defensive end on first and second down every day in the big 10 West. I mean, that's, well, no, I know that. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you mentioned. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Gunnarsson and, Jamari Butler Gunnarsson does have that size that you need that, that you know a couple of those guys lacking by yep. the way we saw Garrett Nelson at that February 28th press conference my god <laughs> he's a big boy I mean, it almost feel you know just as you were talking I was thinking man man maybe they were beefing him up to keep him on the field and maybe play him inside sometimes I I don't know um he was the, he was he's really thick but anyway yeah, I would definitely watch that. Um, if, if I were for I mean, you got it, it, the quarterback position is obviously integral, and you, you want, I think, he, I mean, obviously, you want that QB1 who I like. We're all assuming now is Casey Thompson to, to really hone in and feel as comfortable as humanly possible going into fall camp, but also get that number two spot in order right yep. which i believe i think parker what you say right now is logan smothers oh i think so mostly i mean this is not it's nothing against logan at all um but probably mostly by default at this point because chubba purdy has been limited um by an injury over the first couple weeks of spring i mean you just you know if you can't if you're not out on out there on the field taking real live reps then you're not He's probably not number two right now. There's a long way to go in that competition, but I think Logan's got a real chance to to sort of be the be the guy, especially because. And I will, we'll see with Whipple. I mean, 
This Heinrich will, Harburg too. Yeah, Harburg too. You you only learn this um, when when the chips are down. But Whipple is really adamant about how he wouldn't necessarily call the game the same for each of his his guys if they were in the game. And I think that's I think overall you pro- that's probably favorable. You probably view that favorably if you're Logan Smothers because his skill set's a little bit different than. Casey Thompson is probably a little bit different than Chubba Purdy's. And so the idea that, Hey, if you're the next best option, even if that means a little bit more run or whatever, um, if you have to go in the game, I mean, I think that, I think that helps uh, Logan Smothers in the quest to, you know, more than likely try to be the number two guy. All right. Good job. But Baz, is there anything you want to add about Doc Sadler? Doc, I mean, the one thing I'd say in, in terms of cleanup, I had a lot of people this year say, man, they got to get rid of Doc. They, their defense is terrible. He didn't coach the defense this Doc, year. Doc didn't coach the defense. Yeah, right. Um, um, let's, let's make that clear. Yeah, Doc moved into this. It was the. It's called the special assistant to the head coach role, which is the role that Bobby Lutz held uh, last year. Uh, in that role, Doc, you know, couldn't do on court coaching, whether practice or game. It was a lot of, you know, he could do game planning stuff like that, helping that that regard. A lot. Of, he could help with all the off the court stuff. Essentially, was was the most simplest way to describe it. But yeah, I mean, a guy that that has had a long history at Nebraska, two stints here. Obviously, love to hear if he came back to work for Fred and has has great respect for Fred. So yeah, just I, I my initial reaction is I I guess I kind of feel bad for Doc that he couldn't see it see Nebraska at the next level, you know, because he's poured a lot into this program over the years as a head coach and as an assistant. So it this is what happens if you're, you're restructuring your staff and you're going to make changes this this is these are the things that happen we, we've seen Matt Abdelmassi go now we see Doc go I doubt we're done on that front uh, as far as this, what the staff looks like so we'll see what it is but yeah it's 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 going to be you wonder what's what's next for Doc does he does he saunter off into retirement does, he, he might that keep- might he might be he might be headed toward the beach yeah, you know what? He's got a spot down in Florida where he'd be pretty happy, I think. Mm-hmm. So nothing wrong with that. Hang out with the wife a little bit and, and sit, yeah. watch the sunrise every morning. Like That's Tom long. Brady. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. No. Tom um, Brady spent two months at home with his kids and decided he needed to go back to getting, getting hit. <laughs> I'm not ready for this. Yeah. So – yeah, I mean, that's where it is. I'm sure there's going to be more changes coming. Again, uh, shout out to Nebraska for dropping that news an hour into the next day, of the second day of the, the NCAA tournament. And very Each time much. a round of tournament games starts, something is changing. Yeah, right? yeah be, re- be ready tomorrow morning at about 11 or 12 o'clock again. We'll see We'll see what comes next. So, Well, we missed a riveting first hour. Ohio State is leading Loyola Chicago at halftime, 23 to 18. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's <laughs> physically. That 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 hit Baz in a physical way. I'm, phys- so I'm, in, now, I'm in pain. I'm feeling now, unfortunately, pain the podcast is over, and you have to go watch that that game. <laughs> yeah, twenty-three to so. eighteen. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. That was a good one. We got a lot. We got a lot of ground covered on that one. We'll uh, we'll talk to you next week, where I'm sure we'll have more Nebraska basketball news to share with you, as well as football stuff. So talk. That to was you crazy good. That was crazy good. Crazy, crazy good. good. Crazy good.